Good afternoon, everyone in the room and everyone else um, who's online. I'm really thrilled to have such a good turnout to this event. So my name is Jatin Kala. I'm a senior lecturer at Murdoch University. And in my talk today, I will be talking about the nitty gritty of what we are doing, what it means. Next slide. So <clears throat> this is uh, a, a little outline of my talk. I will just spend one slide explaining why this is actually happening at Murdoch University. I'll then move on to talk about why we actually need um, this process of dynamical downscaling. So as Kelly explained, we have these global models, but they are very coarse and we can't use them directly to inform policy at the regional scale. The process of taking a global model and turning it into regional information is called dynamical downscaling. And as you can imagine, we are not the only group in Australia or in the world doing this work. This is done internationally at many different research institutions. So there's actually a very well coordinated um, international community which coordinates all of these activities and comes up and, and they come up with methodologies that everyone needs to abide by. So I will explain that a bit. Um, that will then flow on to the New South Wales project, why it's important within that international framework, and then how we fit in and what we will actually do. So why why is this happening with um, why why is this collaboration happening at Murdoch University? and not a different university. Um, my group at Murdoch has been very active in this field. As Kelly mentioned, we've got more than 30 papers and counting, which make use of these regional models, right? Um, the, the, the model that will be used to produce these projections is one I've used for more than a decade. And as Kelly mentioned already, Murdoch University is already a partner with the New South Wales government. And that partnership started already a year and a half to two years ago. So Murdoch has already been on the national scene, helping the New South Wales government deliver its project. So we, we are already involved. That involves myself and um, the senior postdoc on the project, Dr. Julia Andrews, who is also one of my previous PhD students and a, a Murdoch alumni. I was also lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 1.5 degree global warming report. So, so I know about this stuff. Um, OK, so what are global climate models? Right, so we, we need to know how the climate will change in the future across the globe. So we cover the globe in this computational grid, this mesh. And at each of these boxes, a whole bunch of equations are solved. These, equa these equations govern how mass is conserved in the atmosphere, how, um, how um, uh, water transforms from liquid to gas to ice, right? They could, they, these equations allow us to simulate what's happening across the globe in a dynamical sense. It's based on mass and physics. So that's all nice and good. These models are really good at telling us what happens across the globe, and they're really good at simulating global weather patterns. But we are interested in Western Australia. So what does the southwest of Western Australia look like in one of these models? So the plot on the left-hand side is the topography in a typical global climate model. Right, you can see the big rectangles. Each of these rectangles is one of these boxes where we do the math. So you can see in a, in a global climate model, we don't resolve topography properly. The coast is very rugged. Um, you can't see the Darling Scarp, for example. On the other hand, in our four kilometer regional climate model setup, which is the plot on the right hand side, you look at this plot and you can tell this is the southwest of Western Australia. You can see the Darling Scarp. 
you, we can actually see that in this model, we will resolve topographical effects on weather and climate properly. Next slide. Something else which is critical is land use, right? In these models, at each of these grid points, what does the model think is the dominant land use type? Does the model think there's agriculture happening? Does the model think there's forests? Does model, the model think it's bare soil, right? So on the left-hand side is land use in a global climate model. All you have to understand is that each color is a different dominant land use type. So in, in and that's actually the Australian Global Climate Model Access ESM. So over the southwest of Western Australia, in that model, there's only four types of land use. Really, there's only three, right? But we know that our land use in the real world is a lot more heterogeneous. So on the right hand side, I'm showing you the land use in our regional climate model. And very clearly, you can see the wheat belt region in green. You can see the shrublands um, to the east of, ra the, the, of rabbit proof fence in, in yellow. You can see the tall forests along the southwest coast. So in these regional models, we resolve the real world as it is a lot better than in these global models. Something else that has huge impacts and that brings all of the rainfall we get in our region of storms. We get storm tracks happening. This is a picture taken, I believe, at Coogee Beach, not far from here. And you can see this, this, uh, this line of clouds moving in and the rain associated with it. Now, imagine a, a, a grid box in a global climate model that represents 150 to 250 kilometers of the Earth, right? Now think about this storm. Right, this storm occurs on a spatial scale, which is significantly smaller than 150 to 250 kilometers. So these global models don't, they can't really resolve um, convective storms very well. So that has to be approximated. So that's why we need them. Okay, so how does dynamical downscaling using these regional climate models work? So on the left-hand side, you have um, the whole globe as seen by a, a global climate model or reanalysis. I'll explain what that is a bit later on. Now, these models have resolutions of 150 to 250 kilometers. What we do in dynamical downscaling using regional models is that we take a big area from the global model, right? a big boundary of, a, of the region of interest. We take data at the boundary of this at this boundary shown in red, and that data is then fed into a regional model. The regional model, in principle, works in very similar ways to the global model. In the regional model, rather than having 150 kilometer grids, you have four kilometer grids, right, at the finest scale. And at each of these grid points, we solve a whole bunch of equations of math and physics. Now, we want to produce projections at four kilometers, but the global model comes at 150 to 250 kilometers. You can't jump from 150 to 250 kilometers to four kilometers in one shot. The, the system will break. It doesn't work like that. The math doesn't the, won't allow you to do that. How do we do that? It needs to be done in steps. So the first step is to go to 20 kilometers. So you see on the on the plot on the right hand side, there's this dotted rectangle covering Australia, some of the tropics and New Zealand, and it says 20 kilometers. So that's the what we call the coarse uh, resolution domain. And then information from that 20 kilometer grid then feeds into smaller grids. And there's one four kilometer grid over the southeast and one four kilometer grid over the southwest. So that's how this works at, at a very high level. Now, as I mentioned, this type of work doesn't happen in isolation. People all around the globe in different parts of the world need to do a very similar thing for their region of interest. So climate scientists all around the globe via the World Climate Research Program, the WCRP, have come together and made up something called CODEX. 
All CODEX is, it's an international effort to coordinate dynamical downscaling activities worldwide. Why is this important? It's really important because we don't want groups all around the world doing their own thing. And then a couple of years later coming saying, oh, I've done this and someone else has done something else and it's not comparable. Right, we also, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to share knowledge. This is the whole point behind Codex and it's a really important initiative. Next slide, sir. So, one of the things that Codex does is define key regions of the globe, right? So if anyone, any climate scientist is interested in doing regional projections for Australia, the Codex protocol says that if you're going to do anything over Australia, we want you to cover this region as shown by this map here. So we want you to cover that box that covers Australia. Why is this? It's because if, say, two different universities are, or two different research organizations, or even someone in a different country wants to simulate climate of Australia, they are all going to use the same domain. That means that when they publish their results, we can easily compare the two. Because if everyone does their own thing, it's going to be a dog's breakfast at the end, right? All right, so Australasia is a pretty fine codex domain. And the, the resolution of that domain needs to be between 25 and 12.5 kilometers. So before you do any dynamical downscaling, the, um, sorry, you skipped too many. Um, can you go back up? Yep. So before you do dynamical downscaling, the first question you need to ask yourself is who is already doing this, right? Who in Australia, is already simulating the entire Australian region, right? Because we don't want to repeat that exactly the same way if someone is already doing it, right? That would be duplication. All right, so who is doing that? Next slide. Turns out the New South Wales government is doing that, right? So we don't need to duplicate what they are already doing. And as I, Kelly and I both mentioned before, Murdoch has been a partner with the New South Wales government to help them deliver their latest pro uh, uh, projections. So hence why we have a very, very strong partnership with the New South Wales government, because we don't want to go and repeat the same thing again. So this is what the New South Wales government is doing, right? They are already simulating um, regional climate over the whole continent at 20 kilometer resolution, right? That's sh shown by the dotted that dotted uh, rectangular shape, right? Everything inside we're simulating. And then because it's the New South Wales government, of course, their highest resolution domain, the four kilometer do domain, which is embedded within the 20 kilometer domain is over Southeast Australia, right? Makes sense. That's uh, the, the new, you know, uh, new South Wales taxpayers money is going into do, to, 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 to fund that, right? Okay, so what are we gonna do? So logically we thought, well, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Therefore, we will use the Cordex Australasia 20 kilometer model outputs already being generated by the New South Wales government. So we will use that as input, and then we will run a four kilometer domain over Southwest WA. One thing, and I will touch on this later on, for now, we're just doing four kilometers over the Southwest because we need to start with what we can manage. But just remember that the rest of the continent is covered by the 20 kilometer, 20 kilometer domain. There's also um, sibling projects led by the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology. And the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology are running different models, but they are also simulating the Codex Australia domain. Right. So in a couple of years time, there will be a whole bunch of data sets covering the whole of Australia and limited data sets at higher resolution for Southeast and Southwest Western Australia. Yep, next slide. So why this approach, as Kelly mentioned, we want to be nationally consistent and comparable. We want to avoid duplication. We want to leverage work and investment already on the way. And we want to align with the national ambitions for the production of climate projections for the whole country, right? We don't want to do our own thing. 
So now, what are we actually going to do? The project has two phases, and this is where it will start getting a bit jargony and technical, but, but bear with me. Okay. So as I mentioned before, Codex is the umbrella organization that provides the guidelines. When you go and read Codex guidelines, you want to do regional climate modeling, you go and read the guidelines. What is the first thing they tell you to do? The first thing they tell you to do is this, right? So as required by Codex, we will first run four kilometer simulations of the Southwest Western Australia with inputs from something called ERA-5 reanalysis that will simulate past climate only from 1979 to 2022. The point of this first simulation is that it establishes the benchmark simulation of the skill of the model in simulating password and climate as close as we possibly can. Now, uh, next slide. Now, what are reanalysis data sets and what is special about this ERA-5 reanalysis that the Codex community tells us to use this one and not something else? All right, next slide. So, what are reanalyses? So we know that observations are very limited. This plot here shows you locations of bureau meteorology stations where there's long-term high quality controlled temperature data, right? So there's not a lot of very, very good quality temperature records. Of course, we're not limited by weather stations. We also have satellite data. We have weather balloon data, we have data from ships, we have data from planes, we have all sorts of data sets. But still, we cannot measure everything everywhere all the time. We just can't. So what can we do? What, well, we, we also do something else, right? So weather forecasting agencies all around the globe, the Bureau of Meteorology, the US system, the Europeans, they are all running numerical weather prediction models, right? So the Bureau of Meteorology runs the access model to try to work out what's going to happen tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, next week, and the week after. So what happens is we, we, seem, we try to predict the weather a few weeks into the future. Then that time actually elapses and we know what really happened in the real world based on our entire observational network. What is a reanalysis? A reanalysis combines these two things together. So we have models that have tried to predict what's going to happen in the next hour, the next two hours, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and so forth for about two weeks. And then we have observations of what really happened in the real world over that time period. Guess what we do? We then combine the two together. And that is what a reanalysis stands for. A reanalysis is a combination of weather forecasting models and best available observations to reproduce the weather and climate as close as possible to what really happened in the real world. Right? It's highly, highly constrained, but it only applies to the past because we don't have observations of the future. All right. So now, this is what a reanalysis is. What is ERA-5 reanalysis? Why are we using that one? So many reanalysis data sets exist, but ERA-5 is the most state-of-the-art, highest resolution, covers the whole globe at 30 kilometers. It's available for free at hourly frequency from 1979 to present. They've recently pulled it back. I think now you can get it from 1950 to present is produced by the Europeans. They are the world leaders in that, and that's why everyone uses their product, right? So the main reason why Codex protocols say you need to do this first is because this is the best reanalysis around. Next slide. So part one of this project and these simulations are running as we speak on Posi. So we will deliver four kilometer resolution ERA-5 driven simulations for Southwest WA. And that will provide a highly valuable climatology of the observed weather climate from 1979 to present. What does this mean? Let's say that you might be interested in say that hail event that happened in 2010 that caused a lot of damage. Our simulations will capture that hail event the way it happened. 
like to the best we possibly can. If you're interested in a particular cold front that happened last year that, you know, bucketed down a whole bunch of rain and you want to study that even in more detail, it will be in our simulations. You want to study about a heat wave event, right? We had uh, four or five days above 40, um, not, not, not for, um, recently, last year. If you wanted to, to look at that in more detail, you can do this using these simulations, right? So think of these simulations as the best we could possibly achieve in simulating the past. But this cannot tell us anything directly about the future. Sure, you can look at trends from these simulations and extrapolate, but it won't tell you anything directly about the future. How do we find out about the future? This is where CMIP-6 global climate models come, come in, right? So this now forms part two of the project. Again, this is all following the international protocols. So what will we do? We will run what we call CMIP-6 driven simulations of both past and future climate. Over the past, what we call the historical period is 1950 to 2015. The future starts from 2015 to 2100, and we will simulate two possible future climates, one called SSP126, the other one called SSP370. I know this is very jargon heavy, so I'm going to explain what is CMIP-6, what are these SSPs, and you're probably wondering when 2023 was, what does the future start in 2015, right? So I will explain that, don't worry. Okay, so what is CMIP-6? Okay, CMI, CMIP stands for Coupled Model Intercomparison Inter Project. The six stands for the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You probably heard of the synthesis report from the IPCC AR6 that came out recently. That report made use of what we call CMIP-6 models. All it means, all CMIP-6 means, is the latest most advanced global climate models that humankind has produced to now, right? The, that, that's what it means. Now, we have CMIP-6 simulations of the historical climate, and then we need to work out what happens in the future. What happens in the future depends on climate policy. There's many different possibilities. These different future climates are defined by what we call shared socioeconomic pathways called SSPs, right? Next slide. So what are these shared socioeconomic pathways? So usually when I teach this in my courses, I spend a whole lecture about this, but I will just summarize it very quickly here, right? So there's um, five SSPs. All they mean are just possible future climates. What is shown on this graph here is from the IPCC AR6 Working Group 1 Summary for Policymakers, and all it shows is the, the observed change in the global surface temperature relative to 1850 to 1900. So that's the black bit. And then once we are 2015, we have these five different lines. Each of these lines is a different future possible climate. You will see that it goes from SSP1 to SSP5, right? Okay, so there's five families of SSPs. SSP1 is where we, the whole world transitions to renewable energy, like right now. It is the best case. SSP5 is a scenario where we burn every piece of coal we can find in the ground. We basically burn all the fossil fuels that we could possibly get our hands on. We just burn the whole lot, right? Okay, so these are your two extremes. And what is shown here is the amount of global warming you will get depending on these different scenarios. You will notice that there's actually a second number. So there's SSP1, 1 1.9, SSP1, 2.6, SSP2, 4.5, et cetera, et cetera. The second number, the 1.9, the 2.6, 4.5, 7.0, and 8.5, that refers to a radiative forcing in watts per meter squared. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but basically the bigger the number, the more warming there is. Okay, so next slide. So based on 
the latest projections, right, we are heading anywhere between 2.1 degrees and 3.5 degrees global warming by 2100. That's where we think, based on current policy, we might end up. So if we look at that range, um, we see that SS the SSP 1 2.6 and the SSP 3 7.0 covers this range of warming. That's the reason why most modeling groups are primarily focusing on SSP 1 2.6 and SSP 3 7.0 as the envelope. The reason why, you might be wondering why are you not running SSP 5 8.5, is because, thank God, we are actually not burning all the coal in the ground. Right, so, so next slide. So following the Codex protocols and the New South Wales project, we will run CMIP 6 simulations for the historical period, so 1950 to 2014, that will have the observed greenhouse gas forcing behind it. And then we'll run two future scenarios, SFC 1, 2.6 and SFC 3, 7.0 from 2015 to 2100. The future starts in 2015, because as you can imagine, even though the IPCC AR6 report came out this year, the modeling groups around the world were scrambling to get started many, many years before, because it takes he heaps of time to, produce, to run these simulations, right? So that's why 2015 counts as the future, because when these model simulations were designed and run, it was quite a few years ago. That's the reason behind it. Okay, so now I've talked about what future scenarios we're going to simulate, but there are many, many, many CMIP6 global models. Lots of them. You can't downscale all of them, right? We just don't have the compute for that, and you don't want to do that anyway. So we think we can manage five, right, as an Australian community. So which five global models of the CMIP6 family are we going to downscale to four kilometers? So a lot of work has already been done on which five models the Australian community will pick. And that's been published by uh, DVSGLO et al. 2021. So I'm just going to go through that very quickly. So what did we do? DVSGLO et al. looked at all of the CMIP6 models, the whole lot. And then we, they simply rejected models that simulate Australian climate poorly. You don't want to use these. And then we also want to use models that simulate the full range of possible future climates. Not all modeling groups manage to simulate every SSP out there. We also want to make sure the models are independent. You don't want to choose two models to downscale when these two models you know beforehand have very similar climate change signals, right? You want to sample models that actually give you slightly different answers, because if you pick models which are statistically very similar to each other, you're just going to get the same answer. We don't want that. We want to sample the variability. And of course, just because a model is good, just because it's independent doesn't mean you can use it because of many technical reasons. Not all modeling groups will, will output all the variables we need to run our model. So right, sometimes there's a fantastic model. We really want to downscale it. Turns out that modeling group did not save some key variables we absolutely need, so we can't use it. That just happens. Okay, so how did that have, How did that work? So on this plot here, um, this is showing um, the skill of CMIP6 models in simulating the annual mean maximum temperature of Australia. The very, very first plot on the top left-hand side, which says AWAP AWAP, that's the observed mean annual maximum temperature in degrees Kelvin, right? All of the other plots uh, follow that blue to red scale. This is simply model minus observations. Put simply, if a model shows up as a lot of red, it means that that model simulates too warm maximum temperatures. If it shows up as a lot of blue, it means that model runs too cold. So ideally, we want to pick models which are in the very pale blue or very pale red, so near zero. And then we did the same thing for precipitation. This is the same thing, except it's showing annual mean precipitation. It's the same idea. You don't want to pick models which show a lot of blue 
These models tend to simulate way too much rain over Australia. Models which are very much in brown simulate too little rain over Australia, right? So this allows us to, 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 to just check out the models which don't do a very good job over our continent. And then, next slide. And then what we do, we do as climate scientists, we produce these quite complicated figures, but actually they're quite simple. Basically, what we want to do with these, this type of analysis, right? You don't have to understand the intricacies of it, but basically, you see, you can think of these graphs as having four quadrants. You don't want to pick models that are very close to each other. So, next slide. So, which is why we ended. So, the Australian climate community, based on this analysis, picked the five models which are shown in blue here, because these models, you will see that they sample the quadrants quite nicely. You don't want too many models in one spot only. So based on this analysis, these are the five CMIP6 global models that we're going to downscale. So what will that produce? This will produce four kilometer resolution simulations downscaling five CMIP6 global models under historical climate, again, 1940 to 2014, future climate under two possible scenarios, SSP 126, SSP 370, from 2015 to 2100. Now, I, want, I need to stress here that the point of these simulations is not to try to figure out exactly what the weather will be say on the 1st of July 2051 at, Murdoch, at the Murdoch University campus. That's not what these models are designed for. What we use these models for is to look at long-term trends, average of at least uh, min usually a minimum of 10 years. The, the standard usually is 30 years. So these simulations will allow us to examine changes in climatology relative to the historical simulations. Now, unlike the ERA-5 simulations in part one, these simulations of historical climate do not incorporate any observations at all in them. They are not constrained at all. We just let the model run. Why do we do that? Because we don't have observations in the future. If you want to compare the future with the past, the simulations have to be run in a consistent way, right? So these simulations don't know anything about observations. So what we will deliver, again, just to reiterate, part one of the project will deliver what we call ERA-5 reanalysis driven simulations. These will relate directly to observed weather and climate. You can actually pinpoint something that happened at a particular point in time at a particular place, and you can question the model. You can question the outputs we produce. That doesn't tell us about the future, which is why part two exists. Part two does both past climate and future climate in a consistent way. But with part two, what you're looking at is what happens in the future minus what's happened in the past. So it will allow us to ask questions such as, what's the winter, you know, by the time we reach 2050, what does winter rainfall look like on average? What do summer temperatures look like on average? How does the statistics of heat waves change? They become more intense if yes, by how much, by how many degrees? Do they last longer by how many days? We can answer all of these questions. Next part. Um, the regional climate model we're going to use, the main tool, has been extensively tested in simulating climate over Australia. We've done a lot of work on that. Because that model itself has its own intricacies, we're actually going to run two different configurations of the same model. They're just going to use slightly different ways of calculating what happens in the atmosphere, slightly different methods. They're going to be the same resolution, cover the same area, everything is the same. These two model configurations, as you can imagine, we've done a lot of work in identifying the two that work the best. So all of this work is currently being written up to be published and submitted for publication soon. Everything we do, so for the ERA-5 and the CMIP-6 historical simulations will, of course, be evaluated against observations. So if you want to use this data, you will be able to find a paper which shows you the evaluation. So you will know what sort of model skill you're looking at. Um, we will produce basically 
What this means, model output variables will be consistent with codex variable list. That pretty much means any variable you would expect out of a climate model, we will we will be producing it, right? So the codex community has come up with a whole bunch of variables that they think most people want, and we're going to produce all of them. So chances are, if you need something, we, we will have it. Um, there's, sorry, can you go back? There's other... Uh, indices that people are interested in that, for example, Codex doesn't require. Um, so fire danger. So when you when you um, every day, right? There's a fire danger rating. How is that calculated? It's calculated based on a whole bunch of meteorological variables and the dryness of the fuel. Turns out we can calculate a similar index from our model output. So we can produce a whole bunch of fancy indices that are useful to different people. So data delivery is under planning, but it will look very similar to what already exists. Next one, what we will not deliver. So this is not a weather forecasting or a seasonal forecasting project. We're not going to tell you what's happening next week. We are not going to tell you what's happening next year. That is called seasonal forecasting. It's a different area completely. And actually, if anyone is interested, I actually have a student who's doing exactly that, right? So we can talk about this another day. There are some limitations for people who are interested about the ocean, that the models we run have a dynamic land and atmosphere, but we don't have a dynamic ocean. The reason behind that is running dynamic land, ocean, atmosphere is very complicated, produces so much data, requires so much compute power that we, we try to keep it simple. So in our simulations, um, sea surface temperatures from the driving model, so that's either ERA-5 or CMIP-6, are interpolated in space and time and provided to the model as input, right? So we are not simulating changes in coastal oceanography. That is given to the model. The, the model sees the surface sea, sea surface temperature. Having said all of that, people who run ocean models on their own without a dynamic atmosphere, will be able to use what we produce to run their ocean models after we finish our work. So, so that, that, that can happen. What are we going to do this year? We, we're getting things set up. So the five global models that were picked, they were picked with a national focus, right? We, they, we looked at the whole continent, but we know that there's particular weather features that affect Western Australia more than the eastern states. These are things like the West Coast Trough, these blocking highs in the Great Australian Bight, which bring the, the hot easterly winds in. We have uh, these fronts coming in winter, right? So we actually, because we have picked these five models, we actually want to know in a bit more detail how they simulate these weather features that matter more to Western Australia than the eastern states. So that is happening at the moment. We're going to complete phase one. Uh, this year, that's the ERA-5 simulations, and get all of the CMIP-6 historical simulations running stably. So there's there's a, there's a lot. We're handling millions of files, terabytes and terabytes of data. So there's a lot that goes behind it. Now, I know I've been talking a lot, but what I want you to take out of this talk is this is the very, very first time we are producing four kilometer projections for the Southwest. We're downscaling five models, two future scenarios, all the way to 2100. Everything multiplied by two because we have two model setups. No, we ha no one has ever done this much for this state ever. Whatever I've done in the past has been a fraction of this due to limited resources. This is the very, very, very first time a Western Australian university has partnered with Dua and the Posey Center to work hand in hand to deliver this. So this is really big. Uh, the project has data sharing at its heart, as Kelly explained. All the work I've done before, you would only know about it if you read my paper and if you knew me and we were in the same community, right? And that's the way it's been for many groups in the past. With this project, this is going to change drastically. Everything we produce will be available via portals. And, and, and these portals will not only have what we've produced, will have also what other groups have produced. 
Right, so this is a really, it's a big game changer. Right now, there is no ADAPT WA website the same way as the ADAPT New South Wales website, right? And, and hopefully we will deliver something like that uh, at the end of the project. I know I've talked a lot here and there was a lot of jargon. Over the next couple of months, we're actually going to write a technical report which will explain everything I've talked about today in a lot of detail, right? So, um, and we will distribute that as widely as we can. Throughout the project, we'll be writing papers, submit them, submitting that to journals. So you will have a reference if anyone wants to use this data set. We, the initial focus in the, on the Southwest, because we need to bite what we can chew, we, and that's what we can manage right now. We acknowledge that the Northwest is a very important region, and we are currently working out how possibly we could run a Northwest domain as well. We right now are only planning to run two scenarios, SSP 126 and SSP 370. Uh, based on what we hear from stakeholders, there's a lot of interest in SSP 245. SSP 245 is midway between SSP 126 and SSP 370. So we are we are planning, we're thinking ahead on how we can deliver more than what I've just presented today. And uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you.